I titled my talk, Putting Youth Participatory Evaluation into Action, because I think it's one thing to think about this work, and it's another to do it. And there's so much that can be learned from the efforts of others to engage in participatory evaluation. In fact, I love the idea that Deborah just mentioned of really thinking about what does it really mean to put youth in the middle of this work? And how can we learn from others who are doing it and help us to think about what we may take home? Um, so as I think about this concept of putting evaluation into action, I really want to focus on the concept of action um, and how evaluation can be a tool for action um, and how can we create spaces to enable young people to, de to develop knowledge that they can use for change. So these concepts of action and change uh, and participation are themes that you're going to hear um, throughout this talk, and I really want you to kind of be grappling with um, how it is that you can involve young people in helping to make movement to take action in your programs, in your organizations, in your communities, in systems, and how can they help to, to move the lever um, on, on making changes around the issues that most impact their lives. So I want to spend just a minute um, about the concept of space, because it's also something that I think um, a lot about in my own work. What are the spaces in which young people can engage in community? So over the course of my work, I've come to think about participatory evaluation through the notion of critical space. Spaces for engagement, for development, for thinking and new understandings, for possibilities, for transformation, and for action. And as an important vehicle for helping young people to leverage ideas, data, and knowledge. So many of us are in this room are doing evaluation all the time and we use it as part of our work. And so it might be simple enough to think in terms of this idea of putting young people in the middle of it. Well, what if we just added a few more chairs to the table and just had young people there? So that's one step towards it, but what I'd encourage you to think is not just what it means to add new chairs to the table, but how's that table transformed by the fact that young people's voices are there? How does it change what we know and how we know and what questions we ask and how we think about this work and how we might approach the evaluation process when new voices are added? So this framing also kind of pushes the boundaries of youth participatory evaluation beyond just a, a, a youth development frame. So thinking, and it's critical for us to be thinking about how this process of involving young people in evaluation helps the development of young people. That's critical and very important, and we know that it has outcomes in that area. But it also pushes us to think about the other realms of influence and impact that this work has. So how does involving young people um, in evaluation not only impact young people, but impact our programs, impact our organizations, impact our communities, uh, and our larger systems? So some key guiding questions for where we're going to kind of be headed today is to think about um, these spaces, and, and they, they model the, the questions that Deborah laid out for us in the beginning um, and the ones that you were talking about at your table. How to create or co-create spaces that enable young people to lever to leverage power and to use data to create change. What do these spaces look like in action? What are some models? Um, and, and how can young people use um, the process of evaluation um, in, in to leverage their voice for change? And I wanna just pause here for one second and talk about the word power um, that um, Jessica mentioned it, that I sometimes bring up and is kind of kind of be embedded throughout the talk. We had a really um, interesting and hopefully for those of you in the conversation, a rich discussion about the concept of power yesterday with some of the innovators. And I think just to say that obviously power is a very complex term. Um, and so some of us thought about power through kind of control or it can confine um, outcomes for people who don't have it or this sense that there's um, a resistance around it. But then others of us thought about power not in terms of this kind of power over, but about what happens when you share power with. Um, and power through organizing and possibility and transformation and influence. And so what I wanna invite you to think about as I kind of use the term power throughout is to think about how power translates to be empowering um, empowering for young people who are part of this process and helps young people to be powerful as the, as the process of evaluation allows people to work together um, to leverage their ideas, leverage their voices, and ultimately influence um, 
the debate, the ideas, and decision-making around programs and policies and practices. Uh, so where I'm headed today um, is to spend a little bit of time um, on the background um, and framing. I want to talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing at Michigan, um, the other <laughs> U of M. Uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time kind of unpacking the concept of critical spaces. Um, but then I mainly want to share with you examples from some of my colleagues who are doing incredible work um, across the country and bring their projects and bring some of the voices of young people into the room. So I'm going to share a little bit of work um, being done in Mississippi um, around a stories project using story and storytelling um, as an evaluation tool. Um, some work out in the Bay Area um, from the Youth Leadership Institute and their Tobacco Use Reduction Force. They're using young people, using community mapping as a tool to leverage power, um, policy change. Um, the Metro Youth Policy Leaders Project that Jess mentioned um, that we're involved with in metropolitan Detroit. Um, and then to um, go back to, um, the, uh, to California and to look at some work being done by young people in Fresno um, that are using um, evaluation to drive um, school change. And then to kind of pull it together by looking a little bit at dimensions of critical space and some overarching lessons learned. Okay, so just a little bit of um, the work that we uh, do at the University of Michigan. So as just noted, I'm an assistant research scientist at the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan. And alongside my colleague, Barry Checkaway, over the last 10 years, we have developed the Michigan Youth and Community Program. It's a research, education, and training program focused on youth and community change. At the heart of our program is to build the capacity of young people and their adult allies to create change on the issues that most impact their lives. Within the area of youth and community change, we work on broad strategies that include young people um, in public policy, intergroup dialogue, youth organizing, and participatory evaluation and research. Um, and through the Michigan Youth and Community Program, we've partnered with organizations across the country and working with young people in many different communities to try to help them um, to build their capacity, again, to work on the issues that they most care about. Uh, so just to say we do this um, through a number of different um, vehicles, as I already mentioned, programs and um, projects that we run, education and training workshops that we do. We focus a lot on cross-site learning and kind of conducting research on best practices that are grounded, again, in the examples of young people's work um, and thinking about what can we learn from them, how do we think about the cross-cutting issues that emerge and, and trends for future directions. We also have produced a number of materials and, and workbooks and case examples, and I think some of you have gotten some of those materials, and I'll share my website, our website at the end, and you can download workbooks and other kinds of resources for free if you're, if you're interested. I also just wanted to, in this kind of context of our work and helping to, to frame the discussion, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to say that there's a lot of different lenses um, that I bring to bear when I think about this work. Positive youth development, civic engagement, youth and human rights. We frame a lot of our work around rights, the rights of young people. Um, a lot of this draws from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives young people the right to ask questions of their community, the right to be involved. And so we think that's a really powerful, um, a powerful frame. Um, and when you engage young people and you, um, and you tell them that they have the right to ask questions, um, it also changes the way they think about themselves and, and who they who they can be and the kinds of questions that they might ask. Um, our work is grounded in community organization and community organizing lenses, um, empowerment, and participatory approaches. And just quickly on this, as I kind of mentioned before, when we use these multiple dimensions and lenses to think about our work, it allows us to think about multiple levels of outcomes. So not just how this work impacts young people, um, because of course it does, their social, emotional, academic, civic development, but also how it impacts the adults who work with them. And this is an area um, where I think there's a lot of potential for future work. We know very little about who adult allies are, why they matter, and not only what they give to young people, but what young people give to them. Um, the impact on organizations, policies, practices, and roles, uh, and the impact on community, and how new ideas emerge, um, the debates are changed, and um, the impact on kind of policies and practices. So all of this builds to kind of a major overarching frame for 
um, that guides my work and, and that I'd encourage you to really be thinking about and pushing your own thinking in your practice, which is that we talk about youth as competent citizens, youth as strengths in their community, as resources, um, and as a um, as a, having a right to participate and engage, right? So young people should be involved in this and our communities are better when they, when they do. And this really contrasts, and I know this is something that you all are part of, um, helping to debate, uh, helping to be part of this conversation, um, really contrasts to kind of traditional social constructions that are out there about who young people are, which often assumes that young people are disconnected, are apathetic, are disengaged, are problems, are risky, are victims, and without agency to create change. And so when we, t so this perspective is really the flip side of that, that that puts agency back into the role of young people, thinks about young people as having a right and having a powerful voice and a voice that should be, um, can be, and should be heard. And so when we, um, so then bringing this then to the lens of youth participatory evaluation and kind of thinking about how we define it, again, so it becomes then youth participatory evaluation as a tool for young people to develop knowledge around the issues that most impact their lives and to use that knowledge for action and for change. And this process then thinks about young people as co-creators of the evaluation process, going back to Deborah's framing about putting young people in the middle of evaluation process. It's not about young people who are just the subjects of the evaluation, filling out the surveys or being part of the, part of the interview, while that's one role they could play, this idea of youth, partic youth participation in evaluation is about moving them more centrally into the middle of the process of developing it, of being consultants, collaborators, partners, and leaders of the evaluation process. So a fundamental theoretical notion that I also wanna just put out um, for you today is this concept of democratizing knowledge. And, um, and Jessica kind of alluded to this in, in her introduction. So drawing from the writings of um, Ainsley and Gaventa and James and, and many others, this notion is getting us to ask fundamentally about who gets to ask questions, who gets to create knowledge, who gets to contribute to what we know um, is very critical to who has the power to create change. And when we think about the work, the research and, the, and, and what we know about young people, it's mostly been about what adults think about from young people, but rarely is it about young people getting to ask the questions or young people being part of that process of creating knowledge about themselves. Um, and so this then kind of allows us to think about what would happen if young people could be part of asking their own questions, about thinking about what they want to know, what would be some strategies for how they might collect information, how they'd analyze and understand it, and what they would do with that information. Um, it also suggests that, um, that when we open up the knowledge process, it's really about strengthening democracy um, as a whole, and thinking again about broadening the access to who can create knowledge, and in doing so fundamentally transform kind of how we think about our work and potentially transform um, the field. In fact, just yesterday, um, as an example, we were talking about how, young, how evaluation can be more engaging um, and how young people can be more involved. And one of the um, innovators was talking about how they were developing the survey, or, in, or they were developing a program um, that was um, getting kind of high school students to think about college access. And they had interviewed and gotten all kinds of information from other programs and from other ideas and had been talking to all these colleagues around different universities about how to do it. And, and then it struck her that they had never actually asked the young people. And how, and how important that might be kind of for future iterations to, to stop and pause and get young people to think about what, what should this program look like. And it's not to say that you shouldn't be interviewing and doing all that other stuff, but again about adding the voice of young people in and how that might transform, um, transform the process um, and think about kind of how it could add alternative paths of, of knowing different points um, of data. Okay, so this is my last kind of theoretical piece and then we're gonna move into examples. Um, but just to say, if you, if you, just to kind of put this back out there one more time. Um, so some of the core concepts that guide our work and again, things that I hope that um, are nuggets, I know many of you are, this will affirm what many of you already think. 
um, but that young people can and should be involved in evaluation. Um, just like um, Divine Mercy said in, in the, on the video, right, ask me, involve me. Um, young people are experts in their lives. Who better to be um, involved in programs and practices in evaluating youth programs and evaluating um, youth organizations than young people, the ones who are the participants in the programs, the ones who are going to school, who better to be involved in, in thinking about how school ought to change than young people who are, who are there. Young people have a critique and an important perspective to share. Um, that participatory evaluation is about knowledge for action. It's not about gathering information and putting it on a shelf. It's about gathering information and using it to create change, and that knowledge is power. I always go back to the kind of, for the, when I was growing up, Schoolhouse Rock was really kind of the big thing, and there was always the person saying, knowledge is power. And, uh, and I think that this is really true. The, those who have knowledge can help to leverage change. And so young people should be part of developing that knowledge. Um, there are many approaches. Um, this can be youth-driven. It can be youth-adult partnerships. It can be a, the adult engagement of young people in the process. But regardless of the type, it's important that and essential that young people have an authentic role and that their voices are valued. This is not about tokenizing young people or kind of asking them what they think and then doing what you were going to do anyways. This is about really creating authentic spaces for young people um, to be involved in that knowledge development for change. So I'm going to just briefly highlight, but some of the kind of overarching, um, there are many questions that are emerging in this field, although it's been around for probably being kind of gathered as a field in the last 15 years or so, the, uh, it's really still on the cut, on kind of the emerging infancy edge. And the more we do this work, the more questions emerge. And I think that's true in any field. But some of the things that I think are kind of uh, things that I'm thinking a lot about um, are how, what are some of the strategies to support young people? Again, this question about adults. What do adults need to support young people? What's the role of creative methods in promoting youth evaluation? And how do we think about new technologies? What are the benefits and limitations to using social media, to using youth media? Um, what are the critical spaces in with which youth participation thrives, and how are these created? Um, and again, kind of continuing to understand and unpack the multi -level, multiple levels of outcomes. OK, so this is just to kind of bring us back to kind of the core framing questions. Um, that to think as we're looking at these examples to just really think about this notion of how did these how can evaluation help to create spaces for young people to take action so with that I'm going to spend um, the the bulk of the rest of the time of this talk to really share some of these examples with you um, and to think about how these key, how these examples help to help you to see how evaluation can be put into action and how evaluation can be a tool for change. Um, these examples draw from, as I mentioned in the beginning, from some of my long-term partners. Um, and so they were kind enough to um, send me um, links to their videos and, and encourage me. They really want, they wanted you to see the work that young people um, are doing and to learn from this. Um, these examples focus largely on youth participatory evaluation in a community context. Um, and so you're going to see young people who are um, working on policy change, who are trying to transform their school systems, who are um, transforming, uh, who are raising awareness about um, tobacco use and trying to um, transform policies and practices around, um, around that. You're going to see young people who are trying to create surveys that are gathering social justice um, indicators that can be used to drive grant making processes. Um, but just to say again um, that young youth participatory evaluation can occur at multiple different levels in your programs, in your organizations, and within systems. So I'd encourage you to kind of get some ideas from what young people are doing at the community level, but to think about kind of what's one step you can take, whether you're thinking about this for your program, for your organization, um, or for a broader scale. And also just to highlight, um, I learned about the incredible work that the Minnesota Youth Council um, is doing, and they just did an incredible survey project um, where it's very similar to the work that we're trying to do in metropolitan Detroit, and I think that they put uh, flyers on your um, on the tables that kind of outline their survey and what they learned and how they're using their information for change. So there are many. These are some examples. There are many examples 
in, in the room out here and examples um, elsewhere. Um, but I wanted to bring their voices uh, to bear. Okay. So to start, I want to first begin by sharing some of the work by colleagues in Mississippi um, to think about how stories and storytelling can be a tool for empowerment and collective voice. Um, so this is the work um, of the Mississippi Safe Schools Coalition. They are a youth-driven organization um, that aims to empower LGBTQQ young people around issues, to organize for changing practices and policies in schools and communities, and to provide a space for issues to be acknowledged discussed and heard by others. Their mission statement says, MSSC believes that it is impossible to make schools safe without, having, without young people having a voice. And that their goal is to listen to stories um, that empower young people to use stories for change. And it's really that last point about stories for change that was at the basis for um, the stories project that they worked on. Um, and the concept of the stories project, which was developed by youth, was to help document and assess how young people experience growing up LGBTQQ in Mississippi and what their experiences are in their communities and their schools and how those stories can be heard acknowledged again and help in a collective sense to, um, to drive policy and advocacy for change at local and state levels. Um, and I think it's especially important in the context of a highly marginalized group to think about the power of stories. And as one of the young people um, who was interviewed in the, in the process talking about how important it is to say we exist and how many communities uh, didn't want to acknowledge um, that young people have stories and, are, and young people have experiences. So the power of being able to tell your story and then tell it in a collective way um, that could be documented and learned from um, is also about the power of saying we exist. So their approach, they conducted statewide listening tours um, and they did interviews, um, they documented stories, they gathered pictures, they gathered video, um, they compiled their stories into a video format um, and developed a rough cut, which MSSC then has used to, to develop policy recommendations um, and to develop fact sheets um, and to help share back elements of those stories in different kinds of ways um, to different stakeholders. And I think what's powerful about this, this stories, and, and um, each one of these, I'm, unfortunately, because of time, I'm just going to give little glimpses of the work that they're doing. But I'm happy to kind of connect you to um, this work if you want to if you want to go more in depth on it. But what's powerful about it. Um, is that it wasn't just the final product, which is indeed still in process, but rather that the process itself helped young people to take action and to leverage change. And that the process of, the, of evaluation has helped to develop a network of young people and allies. And so by the very nature of going out to interview people has helped young people to start to connect with one another and create that network. That's enabled voices to be heard going back to the initial idea of, of evaluation as both empowering and powerful. Um, empowering in the process of having stories heard and powerful in the idea that it's bringing multiple stories um, to the forefront and helping to learn from those collective sets of voices. And while this work is still ongoing, some, again, some of the outcomes have been to build a resource network, share ideas with policymakers, um, and empower young people to be more actively engaged in their communities and in MSSC as a whole. And their website is, is continuing to invite people to share their stories so that they can continue continue to build their, their collective uh, impact. So that's a little bit of amazing work happening in Mississippi. So now we're going to go to the other side of the country and look at a little bit of work that's happening um, through the Youth Leadership Institute uh, in California. Uh, the Youth Leadership Institute, just by way of context, um, is a leading organization in the Bay Area, really throughout California. Um, nationally and internationally recognized um, for their work. They focus on youth engagement, 
youth policy, youth organizing, um, with a focus on environmental and community health in particular, among many other um, issues. At the heart of their work, they engage young people in projects, um, provide training and education, and work to implement best practices. Um, and youth participatory research and evaluation is a key element of everything they do, helping young people to develop knowledge um, for change. So I'm going to share two examples, one now and then um, one um, as kind of the fourth example that just showcased some of their work. Um, this first example is a, involves the use of community mapping um, as a tool for developing data that young people can use to raise awareness, build youth empowerment, and drive um, policy change. And so I want to talk a, just a teeny bit about the work of TURF, um, the Tobacco Use Reduction Force. Um, and so again, using community mapping to identify concentrations of tobacco shops in low-income communities of color, um, developing maps and using those maps to raise, to conduct evaluation research and to raise awareness, um, and then using their information to show, to provide um, presentations to other young people to raise awareness, to think with other young people about how they can use this data to drive change in their local communities and in their schools and in the networks that they're part of and being able to think about um, how this information then can be shared to policymakers. And I think what's really interesting, again, about the power of data, which is kind of an underlying current here, is that when, they, when young people can use maps, um, either GIS maps or other kinds of maps, it helps to provide a different kind of picture of what's happening through the lens and through the vision of young people that when you put in front of different kinds of stakeholders, different policy makers, organizational leaders, it's really hard um, to, to sh not shy away from it because the data is there and the picture is there um, in different kinds of ways. So this is just an example of one of their kind of maps that would show density um, in um, and concentration of tobacco outlets in, in uh, different kinds of communities so that they could um, have that data in front of them. Um, but to give you a true sense of their work, I want to have the youth tell you in their own words. Um, so I wanted to play a, a, a video from YouTube um, that my colleague sent me that really shows the TURF project in action and talks about some of their research and evaluation and how they've leveraged their work for empowerment, awareness, and change. So we're going to try to do this. All right, we're gonna see how this works. It's called Taking Back Our Turf. Many times I feel that young people are not given the opportunity to work on major projects, but I think that they are the most passionate and the most innovative um, to create things like this because they're in the community, they talk to the community, and they're enthusiastic about it. I joined the TURF team because I believe in community change and especially in youth development. Being empowered to make change is inspiring because I feel like I'm kind of showing other people that it's, it is possible that they can create change as young as I am. We're actually conducting surveys, we're actually giving trainings, we're actually talking to youth. It feels really good because then you know you're actually making a difference and you're helping youth and especially people that you know, like your friends and family. In 2008, the Youth Leadership Institute helped us form the Tobacco Use Reduction Force. We came from many different neighborhoods across San Francisco. We had a pretty big goal, which was to find ways to reduce the harm that tobacco causes, especially in lower income neighborhoods. Where we live, tobacco is everywhere. Most of us knew that tobacco harmed our communities. This video tells our story. Tobacco is the leading preventable death it's, it's the most messed up thing because we're able to prevent this, but we're still letting pe these people buy these products that are eventually going to kill them, so they're basically buying their own death. The Mission is one of the low-income communities with high percentages of people of color and youth, and it's also one of the top highest communities with tobacco density. Now I'm standing right here in front of my house, the Mission Plaza. In these apartment buildings, there's mostly families with children and seniors. I just want to show you guys how close it is to get tobacco in my neighborhood. It's just right there. I knew absolutely nothing about land use when I first began working with turf. Through working here, I came to learn a whole lot about it. 
What land use is the separation of land into five different things? Industrial, residential, mixed use, open spaces, and commercial. Land use has to do with dividing territory, um, you know, mandating what territory goes to what, so maybe industries, businesses, houses, um, you know, open parks. I didn't even know that a law existed with that designated what areas for what. So the thing about land use is that if you change one thing, the whole community is going to change. So like if you turn a community into mixed use, so you have, like Mission, you have apartments on top and you have businesses on the bottom, that's going to be a whole different like feeling to that community than some other community that has just, just houses. It's going to be a completely different like feeling to it. People are going to act in, it so, in like a really different way. My name is Lena and this is my community, which is the Chinatown. I've been living here for about seven years now and I've been affected by the tobacco industry. Um, there is at least five tobacco outlets within one intersection and I don't think that's right. Why do we need so many outlets in just a radius of like two blocks maybe? Now follow me and you'll see what I'm talking about. The thing about Chinatown is here we have 25.9 tobacco retail permits for every 10,000 residents. And like in Sunset, they have 5.5 tobacco retail permits for every 10,000 residents. There's a proven fact that if there is a tobacco outlet within walking distance from a school, there is a higher rate of smoking. And as you can see, there's a school or kids just getting out of school. And there's a tobacco shop called Cloud 9. It affects the people, our future generation. The first thing we had done to conduct research was create a survey. So we're going to do the surveys today. We're going to do them in Glen Park. Uh, it's easier to do it there because there's the BART station. They have bus stops on every corner that we can, you know, tackle some people. Plus, they have a library across the street. So I think that's where we're most likely to find the residents of Glen Park. Is. We chose four communities, the Glen Park area, the Marina area, the Mission District, and the Richmond. We, as a group, created a survey to go out into these, into these neighborhoods and ask them how they felt about it, how they felt about people, about teen smoking, about the availability of tobacco in these communities. And we also got help from other people from our expert interviews that helped us out with get other information like our GIS maps. One of our expert interviewees was uh, Ian McLaughlin, and he told us a lot of legal terminology and how the certain languages that we need to use. Some of the things that I learned from the expert interviews were uh, that there was an inside manual into the tobacco companies and their tactics. I learned a lot of facts, a lot about tobacco work, about um, not just here locally, but nationally and internationally. <laughs> The findings I found more startling were the ones that, that came from our survey, that a lot of smokers actually want to limit the number of tobacco outlets in these districts. The problem was that we saw too much density of tobacco retail outlets within communities of color with low income, high percentages of youth. If you look at the Mission District, they have 120 something tobacco outlets. And if you look at the Marina, they only have like 20. Like it would make sense that this area with 120 tobacco outlets have more smokers. There's more, more outlets, more smokers. I think I have impacted a lot of people's life. Uh, with, when I gave trainings, I would give it to a lot of youth that were like from low-income neighborhoods, and they would see all the hard work that we put into this one training. They would ask us, like, hey, how could we be a part? We want to you know, create change in our community. And they were like real down with the work that we were doing. But let's say that still, there's some folks in the Bayview, there's some folks in the TL that call us up some organizations, right, that work with youth and are like, we heard about your presentation, could you please give us one? I think some of the more impactful work that we do is spread the knowledge to those folks, you know? Hello everyone, my name is Lisa, and I am a youth participant of TURF, also known as Tobacco Youth Reduction Force. And what we do is, we're trying to create positive change through education and awareness through youth involvement. Um, through our training, we have a lot of kids that are interested in tobacco, and we have a lot of teachers that are interested in tobacco, and we have a lot of teachers that are interested in tobacco. Youth Leadership Institute taught me a lot in how to develop my leadership skills by, like, how to talk in front of people, how to do focus groups and like conduct meetings. I believe I have impacted people's life by as little as educating them on how to create change within their own community. Uh, to be empowered to make changes, it's a weird feeling because because you know you have the capability of doing it and it just kind of like, it's, it motivates you to go out there and actually help out. Like, you know you have the skills to go out there and talk to somebody. You're gonna wanna go do it. You're gonna wanna go help out. You're gonna wanna 
make the change in your community. You're gonna to want to change the things that are bad in your community. Make your community a whole lot better. So I just I wanted to showcase that as just one example, the many examples of um, of youth research and evaluation that are out there, but just to show how young people again are using evaluation to drive questions that they um, are curious about that they feel are critically important to what's going on in their communities and how they can use their information to raise awareness, to uh, develop presentations, to spread knowledge to other adults, to other young people, and ultimately to use that knowledge for change. Um, and just to give another example of um, this idea of how community mapping um, can uh, be powerful um, is that there's so many efforts to do kind of planning and to do development in communities and towns and they're interested in kind of how we can make communities more walkable or more livable or um, thinking about kind of what the what the next generation of plans ought to look like and rarely are these um, efforts involving young people and saying how do young people um, see the future of the community and how do young people experience their own neighborhoods and so thinking about um, some of the young people who use community walking tours as a way for them to kind of document what they see on their streets and in their sidewalks and the importance of com both the the positives and the challenges and how that can be brought to bear in terms of community planning processes okay so now moving from California back to Michigan and spending a, a little bit of time um, talking to you about some of the work I'm currently involved in with the Metro Youth Policy Fellows Social Justice Assessment. Um, just to say this is a partnership um, with the university and with a community foundation um, and is uh, involving young people in developing a regional assessment that can be used to help to understand how young people experience um, their schools and their communities and what are their kind of critical issues. In many ways, this um, is a parallel process to the work that the Minnesota Youth Council um, was doing. And like the Minnesota Youth Council, this will help to drive not only policy platforms, um, but also be used for developing a social justice grant program and helping to provide a funding, a funding pool for um, really good ideas that come from young people people to address some of the um, issues and to tackle some of the recommendations um, that emerge from the collective voice of young people um, in the region. And just to say that this project is a piece of a much longer, um, a much bigger program called the Youth Dialogues on Metro, um, Youth Dialogues on Race and Ethnicity in Metropolitan Detroit. Um, and that's a project that um, engages young people in a highly segregated metropolitan area like Detroit, bringing young people together across race and across ethnicity to have discussions um, and dialogues with one another across city and suburb um, and to think about not only their own lives but also to think about what does it mean to grow up in, in a segregated region and how can young people work together to, to create change. And some of the evaluation has always been a core element of this program um, and we use evaluation in multiple ways both in terms of formalized evaluation and pre-post test surveys and all the kinds of things that, that you might have in a traditional youth program but we also have always always involved young people um, as, a, as a component of developing their own evaluation. And so some of the ways that, um, that they've evaluated the program, again, are to, to use the idea of storytelling and collecting stories. And one of the cool things that happened a number of years ago is as young people, as our, the youth evaluators were collecting stories about how young people experienced growing up in Metro Detroit and what their um, what their um, what their worlds had been like and how the program had affected them. We were in partnership with a youth theater troupe who had also been a participant in the Dialogues program, and they took the writings of the evalu the youth evaluators and the stories that they had collected in the interview information um, that they had gathered um, and collected a little bit more on their own and turned it into a play um, and, a, and put it into a script. And so the script was the stories from the evaluation, and the play is called Speaking for Yourself. And, um, and that play then was um, really highlighted kind of young people's voices and how inevitably young people have to speak out for themselves about how they feel. Um, and you can't just let media tell young people about how to think or, or, um, or what they should think or how they should know things. Um, and that play has been done in all kinds of uh, communities and schools across Michigan and in other places um, as well. Okay, so a little bit about um, 
this program, so this, this current project really continues this tradition um, and again is about creating a regional space for diverse youth voices, developing the policy platform and creating the, uh, the grant process. And so part of thinking about this work then was about how do you really create a space for diverse perspectives. Um, and so what I want to share about this project is really about the internal work that's being done in the process of developing the evaluation and the way space is being created to engage diverse voices. And so some of the things that, that we've been working working on is really thinking about when you bring young people together, especially across a region, again, where young people don't have the opportunity to work together in new ways, but it's really crucial to have their voices be part of a regional assessment project. Um, if we're going to be about the region, it needs to include a diverse, a diverse group of voices, is to be able to think about how do you understand individual motives and create a shared sense of purpose. Why are people doing this? What do they care about? And how do we own that together? And this tree picture is an, is an activity that we did where people were kind of drawing um, their ideas and thinking about what strengths do they bring, what's the root of their work, what grounds them. Um, and it enabled us to then share, share different people's ideas and perspectives and, and build something common together. Um, really spending a lot of time, the process of evaluation, if you're, gonna, if you're really going to involve it in a participatory way and involve diverse voices, takes time and really takes effort to try to figure out how you listen and learn and work together. So spending the time to do team building. So some of these pictures are different team building activities that we do regularly to really help check our process and think about how are we working together as a team, both youth and adults together. Um, to really think about questions around privilege and standpoint and how do people um, come to know what they know and so that if we're going to do evaluation that's going to be asking about how young people experience the region, then the questions that we create are grounded in our own realities. So how do we understand that, how we, we talk about that, um, and how do we think about the multiple perspectives um, in the room and building a survey that will really capture that, um, that, all, that each person's perspective matters and multiple ideas and pr approaches need to be considered. So again, because this is about a regional youth voice, it's also meant that young people have to consider multiple strategies um, to engage, uh, to really ensure that we're getting the broad reach of uh, the region. And so just this is kind of a, a really rough uh, map of metropolitan Detroit. And the red stars are the places where young people um, who are policy fellows um, are from. And the yellow stars represent some of the communities that we're closely partnered with and community organizations. But clearly, there's a whole lot of the region that's not um, that's not covered by these stars. And so being able to really think about how do we leverage our own personal networks and organizational networks to try to get that broad reach. And so that's a lot of the work um, that we've been doing is to kind of map personal networks, map organizational map networks, map broader partnerships, and then to continually step back and think about, well, whose voice is still missing and how do we try to capture that? Um, and so they're also thinking about using uh, the internet to, to, try to, to try to capture that. Um, and then also recognizing that surveys can be a limiting approach and thinking about kind of multiple points of access and multiple points of entry for young people to participate. So this isn't about participation one time, but rather a process that can also encourage and nurture and strengthen the way young people can be involved um, over time. And so in addition to the survey, um, doing community uh, meetings and town halls that both get uh, gather information about what young people think, but also provide a space for young people to kind of think about what they might want to do with this information, how they understand it, and where they might want to take it, and uh, larger policy summits that bring young people together from across the region to really weigh in on some of the findings and some of the ideas and to think about change. The other thing that this project and kind of looking at um, the multiple, thinking about kind of networks um, also allows um, us to think about who else is doing this work and how can this work not be done in a siloed way um, or in a way that is um, duplicating what is already being done, but how can the process of young people being in evaluation help to leverage the work that other young people are doing? And so thinking about how do they how can they um, connect with other young people and other youth groups that are doing their own evaluation projects and this being a vehicle for bringing all that data together and sharing and learning from one another and thinking about what, what's possible through the collective, um, through, the, through a broader collective effort. And just 
to say that this process is still ongoing. In fact, this weekend, the young people are finalizing their survey, and it's going to be launched. So stay tuned, and I'll hopefully have some more information to share. I'm going to really quickly um, just talk about the success um, group in Fresno, and I, um, I think I'll provide the link um, because we were having trouble uploading it earlier. So given that, um, and, and then I can move on to, to uh, the dimensions and then uh, so we have enough time for questions but just to say that the Fresno group um, is really doing some incredible work um, again like the uh, a group through the Youth Leadership Institute and thinking about how young people can be involved in community-wide issues especially um, school discipline policies and they did a pretty extensive evaluation where they were gathering existing data conducting focus groups conducting interviews and one of the things that I think is really interesting about what they've done then is harnessing the role of social media to help share their findings. Um, and so they've used Prezi um, kind of formats, and then they've used um, kind of a cool web-based platform um, to share their findings. So the video that I was going to show you had young people kind of talking about what they did. But then on the, um, at the same time, there were all these li little click boxes all around um, that you could click to go to a survey of um, you know, county level indicators, or you could click to go to um, a report about school achievement, or you could click to learn more about the organizations that are, that are part of the partnership, or you could click to sign a petition if you want to get involved and take action and, and come to a next meeting. So the idea that the, that the process of the internet can not only be a tool for just purely sharing information, but also can be a way to invite and enable participation in policy action and change. And so really, again, kind of continuing to create spaces um, throughout every aspect of the evaluation process to encourage young people um, to be involved. And I think um, with the ever-increasing role of technology and social media, it really begs thinking about how social media can be used within evaluation um, and where social media can help think about evaluation, youth participatory evaluation in new ways. Okay. So just to say, uh, kind of thinking about these four models, some of the kind of ways uh, that I think they help to think about this notion of creating space, right? So that we've talked about the importance of voice and the importance of storytelling as a tool and de developing mechanisms for youth to learn from one another. The ability to use data to raise awareness and build support and thinking about evaluation as, again, a tool for empowerment, um, but also empowerment and, and being powerful. Um, the importance and the critical need for diverse perspectives and developing multiple points of participation. And again, how we might think about harnessing the power of social media to share data to link and to link actions, to link data to actions um, and ch to change. So in this kind of closing part, what I want to do is kind of return back to those broader questions that I raised um, so, so long ago um, around the notion of what does it really mean to put evaluation into action? That's what we were, that's what we were all about today and trying to think about different ways that young people are using evaluation to, to create change and what are the, and how do you create those spaces to really involve young people in new ways? What are the spaces and what are the dimensions of those spaces? How can youth participatory evaluation be both powerful and empowering? And so what I wanted uh, to share with you um, or to offer to you is kind of a, a model or a framework um, that includes kind of building on these examples and some of my own work, six dimensions that I think are really important for um, considering and hopefully for things that can help to drive your practice or stretch your thinking, again, whether you're thinking about how to involve young people in programs, in organizations, or in some of the ways that we've seen with kind of community level or even state level policy work. So the first is that um, young people, youth participatory evaluation needs to fundamentally about youth, be about youth voice and about the authentic engagement of young people. There needs to be opportunities for young people to have ownership over the process and to be part of the planning. And when it is, it can be very powerful. It recognizes that young people are experts, right? And so I've mentioned this before, but who better to be part of evaluating the programs that they're part of um, or the organizations that they're part of or understanding what services and supports and issues are facing young people than young people themselves. 
Um, so, and that when they are involved, that it can be very empowering um, and lead to new ideas. Um, and I just want to share just a really brief story about where this played out with some young, peop young people that I worked with in Massachusetts. And I told this story yesterday to some of the innovators, but um, we were doing a workshop in, and, uh, one, and there, it was on evaluation. And one of the young men um, who was part of it had been in and out of homeless shelters. And so they were thinking about and kind of in, in and out of different kinds of um, service supports in the community. And when we were talking about what's the issue that you want to evaluate and learn more about and do something about, um, they, they wanted to know more about why, why it was that young people, why some of his friends had had trouble accessing social services and had been resistant to wanting to use the services, and he himself had had that experience. He'd been in and out of services, but hadn't always had a good experience. And so what they did for, through their evaluation is created a way for, for this youth evaluation team to ask other young people about how they experienced the services. What was it like for them? What was the, um, what did they need from those services? And on the same side, they went and asked the adult service providers, what were their perspectives of, you know, young people? And what were, um, and how were they providing services, and, 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 and what did they think young people need? And then they brought those two perspectives together and shared what young people were really thinking and how the adults were thinking about it and how could they create a dialogue between young people who need services and adult service providers to help drive um, drive new services and new practices. And, to th and the that the process of this young man being part of it was not only empowering to him, and he talked about how he never imagined that he could have a voice in driving policy change and how that transformed the way he thought about himself and what role he could play in the community, but helped to really provide critical information to drive uh, services in that community in the future. Okay, second, make it meaningful that youth participatory evaluation needs to be grounded in issues that young people care about. Um, if evaluation is seen as extra or outside work, there's often a resistance. There's a resistance for adults if it's seen as something additional. So thinking about how evaluation just gets built into the fabric of what you do, the fabric of your programs, the fabric of your organizations, the fabric of how your communities work, and, and thinking about how young people can be at the heart of, of again, thinking about what they, what's they care about and grounding it in their lives and in the issues that, that they think are most uh, important. Youth participatory evaluation needs to be a space for curiosity. And this, com this idea of curiosity comes from my colleague um, at the Youth Leadership Institute. And I think it's a really, a really important point to, 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 uh, to note that engaging young people and asking the questions requires them to really be curious about their programs and curious about their organizations and communities and, and really getting them to think about what it is that they want to know um, and what questions can they ask and that too often in our society young people are being told what to think or being told you know, kind of what to know, and they're not given that space to ask, to think about what it is that they'd want to know, to be curious about about what's happening in their schools and their communities and their lives. Um, and sometimes they're even that's even resisted. And so thinking about how this process can create that space for young people to be curious um, and to raise critical consciousness, um, and again, to think about um, how that process can help lead to action. And for us, I think it really just begins with the, the, with most simply asking young people about their ideas. So I talked a lot about this um, already, but thinking about how to link evaluation to action, evaluation as a tool for developing knowledge, um, which leads to change. And too often we do evaluation, but we don't necessarily have a strategy for how we're going to use it. We think about why we do, you know, so thinking about why we do evaluation and how it can be used and for what is a really important, um, an important step. And it also allows us to, again, to really think about that link between evaluation um, and, and change. So when, of, um, so just a, kind of a fifth point, when uh, young people engage in evaluation, again, it's critical to think about how to analyze networks and identify stakeholders, in part because it engages a diverse range of voices throughout the process, but to then also think about how and where information can be used. Who needs to know it? And this goes back, I think, fundamentally to the point that Deborah raised in the beginning. How do you leverage your role as a youth worker or as an adult ally, a term we use, 
um, to open up those spaces. Sometimes we think about adults as having as being adults as allies and adults as bridgers, um, having one foot working with young people and one foot trying to open up and um, and be part of opening the spaces for young people to have those conversations. So I think that um, notion of kind of understanding, thinking about networks, thinking about stakeholders, and thinking about innovative approaches is also about us as adults who work with young people or who want to work with young people to really think about what's our role in helping to understand and leverage our networks for change. And just last, um, that youth participatory efforts are often driven by young people, but they need adults, right? And so how can this process of, of evaluation be a vehicle for young people and adults to work more closely together, to build relationships, um, to build the process um, of listening and learning between youth and adults and flowing information back and forth and ultimately building that kind of intergenerational engagement that I think is critical for all youth development work, for all, for all kinds of work. Um, so just to kind of close this up, while these are, there are many other dimensions, I think these are some of the ones that most stand out for me and that I wanted to make sure um, to share with you uh, today. So just a couple final ideas, and then I'm going to be going to give you a couple questions to to kind of noodle with as you uh, throughout the rest of the morning. Um, so I know I've said this a number of times, but thinking about knowledge for power and how to develop knowledge for change, and how when young people participate in evaluation, it can help to transform what we know and how we know, and that raising new ideas about questions, about methods about analysis and about sharing and using information. Opening up that process to put young people in the middle of evaluation and thinking about how it changes what we, what we can know and how we know things. Um, it has promise for strengthening the role of youth as citizens, as competent agents of change, back to that guiding framework. It has promise for thinking about new ways for youth and adults to work together. And ultimately, again, it's about linking evaluation to action. So I hope that um, the last hour has provided you some ideas, some perspectives, some examples, um, some tips, um, that it's raised some questions for you or has affirmed some of your ideas. Fundamentally, this work is about putting evaluation into action. And again, youth participatory evaluation as a tool for developing knowledge, empowering young people, building power, and creating change in our programs, our organizations, our communities, our policies, and our practices. So I want to end by kind of challenging you um, to think about some questions for taking home, some questions for, for you to consider in thinking about how you can put evaluation to action uh, in your own work. How do you help create these spaces? How can young people more effectively use evaluation, be part of evaluation, or if they're already doing it, strengthening their involvement um, in evaluation in your programs, in your organizations, and in your communities? How can you leverage your networks, the question that Deborah raised? How can you leverage your role as a youth worker in helping to create these spaces, helping to engage young people in evaluation, helping to have the conversation about why it might matter to involve young people in evaluation in your programs, your organizations, and communities? And lastly, like we do with all of our work, what's one thing, what are you going to do with what you learned here today? and what you're learning from the work that you've been doing throughout this series. What are you going to do with what you learned, and what's one step? What's one step you could take, even if it's to have a conversation with someone about it, um, and even start to raise the possibility of what evaluation could look like if, um, in your organization or your program. And for many of you who are already deeply engaged in it, to maybe think about how you can share, get, share your examples with other young people across the country who are doing it, and how other young people um, can learn from you and you can learn from them.